you wanted something more from life, you had to go outside to get it. If you can't get money here in Harlem, you can't get no money nowhere. You heard of Three the Hallway? Well, this was the real Three the Hallway. Al Paul, AZ, and Rich Porter. They was the mayor of Harlem, all three of them together. The small fried motherfuckers that was running errands. Man, for the niggas back in the 70s, was bosses, man. It's like everybody here is Michael Jordan in comparison to views in the NBA. Everybody a superstar. The Harlem niggas was the most super flamboyant fly niggas on earth, man. Even the, even the big dudes that was in Queens, the big dudes that was in the Bronx, the big dudes that was in Brooklyn, they was all coming to Harlem. It's coke, it was dope, it was cracked. Everything was selling. I don't think nobody in the city was moving coke and crack like what's going on in Harlem. We was the youngest niggas probably in history to ever do it the way we did it. Al wasn't the richest nigga in Harlem, but he was one of the most popular because of the shit that he was doing. Well, people knew him as Alpo. I knew him as Negro. He was just like every other kid in the hood, man. We was all trying to find something to take our mind off the fact that we was fucked up. Because everybody thought he was black, but he was just a dark-skinned Puerto Rican. That nigga speaks Spanish very well. The 70s and 80s was rough. The state of black America is still very grim. Mom's on welfare, you know, dad not at home. He was a good kid, without a doubt, man. He was a damn good kid. He was very humble about a lot of things. As far as I know, it was always his mom who did everything. Mostly, you see, uh, you see Poe, and you seen his youngest sister. If he had a problem with somebody or something like that, and his mom's come down, his moms are like, be like, yo, that's my son. Don't touch him. She'd be on the front line. Ho just, for some reason, always stood out. His mother always had him into, you know, she was always taking him, like, to camp. He was going to wear this fresh air fun. We all did that. He stayed the summer with a white family, I think. There was another little boy that the family had that was their son. And Al was like their son. You know, he spent every summer with the same family. They always wanted him back. He was just part of the family. We just accepted him to come. We just liked to have him every year. He, he really was a good kid. He, he nobody, I, I can't imagine anybody not liking Albert. And that proved to be the case once he got here. You know, when you, the your first time you met him, you just liked him. He, he adapted to that, which, which was good, because he was able to see um, how different people grow up. Going to the boys' club, wanted to be a Marine, wanted to be a cadet. And they loved him over there. I mean, you can go to Third Avenue on 111th Street, and his pictures were everywhere. If you have a strong structure, it's like you could easily lose it because you'll be outside, you know, learn how to try to make a buck. We have a community filled with drugs, and on the streets we have young people who seem hopeless and are hopeless. They didn't have no guidance by looking at the motherfucker that was working. The nigga that was working was struggling. It was three of us. Me, Paul, and one of y'all, you know what I mean? And us three like that, you know, we, we was about money, man. Like any other kid, he didn't want to be depending on his mother all the time. Anybody that know each other project is right on the, uh, right on the drive. So, we would take a garbage can, throw it on the FDR drive. And that would slow the traffic down, then we'd go to the back. When it congests, you know, niggas just walking alongside the, like the, the barrier, till you see that white chick with that purse open, with that yak, or that nice diamond chain or whatever, and we just yap it. Jump back over the wall, run through the projects. But I guess that didn't work out for him. I really remember when he was real young and a, a certain OG around the way had him on the corner. Yeah, our producer worked for me back in the days and shit, you know? And uh, he was out there hustling and I was like, yo, what that nigga doing out? Why he always out there? He said, man, that nigga, you know, he's selling that shit. You know, Paul be the first one out be cold as hell. So Paul was really trying to get that money. I seen he really want that money. You know, you gotta be out there at six in the morning to fuck with the hell on and shit. So our producer can get a nigga at 5.30. We still be sleep, Pope come out, you know, be early in the morning and he have a knot to already because he don't caught them fiends, you know what I mean? But sometimes I was too lazy for that shit I hung out the night before. So I lose hit I'll pull this shit, tell him to go ahead and do you, I'll pull go do you. When that nigga started popping, he was about 13. He was he was he was like one of the youngest cats out. He started to be real young. It was the, that very last time that he came and he must have been only like 15 and a half and he had the big chains on, the big gold chains. The kids around here noticed these things immediately and started asking questions. At this time and age, that might be normal.
but I'm talking about back in 78, you understand, a 13, 14 year old kid, you know, 79, that wasn't normal. He was very street smart, very, and he would observe everything. You could tell he was gonna blow up because he was no lazy hustler, you know, he was out there going to get his, man. Nigga had the eye of the tiger and he was hungry, man. Poe wasn't drinking, Poe wasn't smoking no weed, Poe didn't do nothing, you know? Poe was strictly about getting paper and putting that shit away. There's some shit like LeBron James got, he got it, Michael Jordan had it, Poe had it. Poe must have saw a big fantasy of uh, something, man, Poe, because of the way Poe. When my nigga Al met my man Shorty Love, and my man Love showed this nigga the way what this is, his game wasn't aggressive at all. When he got with Randy, the, the beast came out with him. When Al put me Randy, somehow Randy installed an aggressive defender in him. And he just went ahead and did his damn thing. And he learned, like, listen, if you want, if you want to get in the game, you got to be 110% sure, because a nigga will take you out and never underestimate the man that don't get nothing. My niggas and numbers was going on the grind and stick the motherfucking Dominicans up. And they had to send a nigga in there, like my nigga Poe was, he knew Spanish. They didn't know he knew Spanish. So they were talking that laga, 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 laga. He was on the side letting niggas know what to do. As soon as Poe get in the house, nigga tell you, no, he tell you, man, this is on the second floor. Bam, just come up here and kick the door down. Watch out for this nigga. The gun is over there, the coke is over here, the keys over there. See, he playing, he buying it. Yo, listen, hold up, I gotta go to the car and get some more money. That's when niggas come in and stick eggs in them. The adrenaline that Poe got. That shit felt so good to anybody, practically, but the adrenaline felt so good, man, it gave him a rush. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Wait, let's go up here and put pressure on these motherfucking, put pressure on these motherfucking niggas across town, and we get a bunch of keys, and we just locked the whole area. Yo, they had the whole east side on lockdown, man, for real. They had the whole east side on lockdown. He was only 15 years old when he flew up, and it was like overnight. He was like a joke wearing on the outlaws. He had a posse. When them niggas rode, they was no joke. Them niggas, if, you, if they went into your house and it was drama, them niggas even turned the fish tank over. They didn't leave no witnesses when they get in that game. After he learned what that heart felt like and how ruthless he had to be to maintain his game and get them papers, he got that. It was a time when he would joke around, but when he was serious, that Puerto Rican would come out of him in a minute. The game was rough, so he just, you know, he put his grind on. He had stick-up kids in check. You know, he was checking stick-up niggas. He was telling niggas, well, listen, that's my spot, don't fuck with that. And they wasn't fucking with it. And it was funny to watch this young teenage kid work 45, 30-year-old men and how he would work them and tell them to go to the store and get him a sandwich. Go over there, do this for me. And how they would listen and respect him. New secret offensive is underway tonight in the war on illegal drugs. It is aimed at stopping the supply of cocaine. Timing was everything because all the older hustlers had faded out and the game was wide open. This is the kind of um, the lucrative profit that's in this whole business. Which one of you was asking where we're going to get the money? <laughs> this is going to help the deficit being reduced, huh? Yeah, there it is. This whole area right here was nothing but the tires. They had the drugs in lockdown. But them niggas, so many of them niggas was getting knocked off and niggas was going to jail and niggas was snitching them. So that allowed the Colombians to come in and fill the void. Yo, they started giving it to a nigga cheaper than what the, what the Chinese was giving it to a nigga for. Their production is equal to nearly three times the amount of cocaine that was brought into the United States last year. These countries uh, who say they're our friends and they're our allies, they're destroying us. They're going to turn us into a banana republic. We're not fighting a war, but we darn sure are losing the battle. America's already starting to take that message to heart. The United States has sent six Black Hawk assault helicopters and 160 U.S. Army pilots and maintenance personnel to Bolivia. This is worth something like $60 million. The Dominicans had it. They needed somebody to move it. You know what I'm saying? The blacks was the ones that could move it. A revolutionized this shit. When you heard Poe, you heard Rich. When you heard Rich, you heard A. Before you heard Al Poe, you heard AZ. I was getting joints for a dirt price, man. I don't think nobody on the street can compete with the prices I was getting. But he, he came up with a gimmick. Like everybody else was selling little small bottles. He came up with the GP35s and was selling them shits for like dimes and he killed them. This big for $10. You know, when niggas was selling shit this big for $50, this is how A blew. These niggas was getting real money. This is the good part of your city. You come up here for a dime. You know, 
everybody in the city knew about the jukebox. They started hearing about it. They said, yo, that jukebox is getting money. And people started seeing the lines and this and that. I mean, it was ridiculous. Again, it was ridiculous. Like, we just tell customers, yo, wait on the other side. And that's how come you had to bottle up everything once we got it because it was, it, you could never give it a time where they was going to wait. You couldn't have the customers waiting too long. You had to always be ready for them. I mean, they was coming like that. You figured we was giving up almost close to a half a gram for $10. We learned that a prominent athlete has died because he took cocaine. You couldn't go buy this from nobody else. You couldn't go buy the material that they had. They had it really fucking good. When Poe went over there and got that money with them West Side niggas, got introduced to AZ, this big player, young kid in the game. The nigga just totally just took charge of shit, man. You know what I mean? A didn't have to tell him what to do and how to move. He knew how to move, you know what I mean? The nigga was a wolf. He was kind of aggressive. You understand what I'm saying? I guess A took a liking to that, and, you know, he immediately put him down. I believe Alpo wanted it more than the, than, than the other cats that was around me. He wanted to see how far he could take that shit. Like, he was more like, I want this shit, man. I love this shit, man. He was destined to be rich, man. You know, AZ used to put me through a lot of little, he used to test me a lot of little times. He used to, like, he would give me a, a a certain amount of bricks or whatever and tell me like, you know, go bottle them up. We had to sit down there and bottle 10 bricks. He gonna sit down there with me and make sure each, you know, bottle and bottle before he go out to work. Yeah, A, a didn't play that. A didn't play bottle up this. And you had to bottle up the whole brick. Because the spot, not, not just 30 foot, but 40, 50 was moving so quickly. At times he was doing two, three bricks a day. A took a liking to him because he was about his business. Say, for instance, okay, Connect give me 100 bricks, and they say, okay, give me a million dollars. I'm not going to bring the Connect back 999 million and 99 cents. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make sure they have that, that penny to make it a million dollars. Even if a nigga fucked up my shit, whatever, that's not their business, that's my business. You understand? I take it out of mines and here, boom. Why? Because as soon as they say, I say here, they say here. You understand? And then they be in a position like, thought like, man, I don't want to lose this cat. This cat is loyal. And to me, loyalty brings forth royalty. I, I seen the bigger picture. Right. So there's no reason for me to be petty like that because he wasn't petty with me. He had ideas, he had ambition, you know what I'm saying? He had dreams and he wasn't letting nobody get in the way. No means necessary, nobody wasn't getting in the way of his plans. The loyalness and the realness was just, you the chief. Ain't nobody gonna be talking to you like that. You ain't gotta tell him to smack this nigga in the mouth. He never let A down in the streets when it was crunch time. I remember one time, we was in my Jetta. I had a white Jetta low in the trunk. We had about, we had about 100,000 in the trunk. We pull over, we say, let me get over here my daps real quick. I pull over, blow in there. Some, some other cats in there, older dudes in there. The generation before us, they get money in, dabs, talking, whatever. He come right back up the studio. Hey, come in for me. Come in for me. Yeah, here go my man right here. Because he used to always pop shit to these dudes. He, he take the trunk, the bag out the trunk, throw it all on the floor. Yeah, we get money, motherfucker. You think it's my man, Big A? He the new boss. I'm like, this thing's crazy, man. I slid out the store, got back in my Jetta. Like, who the fuck? Yo, this dude is nuts. But that's who Poe was, man. I was doing a bid in the 80s, man, and, uh, you know, Al came up to see me, you understand what I'm saying, and, uh, you know, it was a surprise visit. And then I'm hearing how he was going on visits to see his man in jail. He putting down stacks of money on the ground, taking pictures. The police was looking at this nigga. I guess the inmates in the, in the joint was telling the police who this nigga was and all that, and he came up with the crazy jury, the big-ass rings and shit, and the, and the police niggas want to take pictures with the nigga ring and all that old crazy shit, man. The, the visit was just ridiculous, man. Everybody stopped doing what they doing, man, and started paying attention to us, man. When we was young, and we was down the hill, we was getting paper, a whole lot of it. And there used to be dudes down there getting short paper. They wasn't really getting no real paper, but, you know, they didn't extort us or nothing like that, but they would wait for A to leave, and then they'll go stick the joint up. You know, A was, is the kind of person that's, you know, he, he don't want the problems. He, he called like a little semi-meeting amongst like his brother and the kid Stanley and all that and he asked them like do they want the spot now he gave opportunity 
for anybody that was in the crew before Alpo came along to get the jukebox. But they were so used to being, you know, basically like spoon fed mm -hmm. that they wasn't ready to leave the nest. Everybody was used to kind of everything being smooth. You know, when you was working with A, everything was just smooth. It wasn't no headaches, it wasn't no murder game or none of that. So when it came to me, I was like, hell yeah. I went in there with a broom and swept up all the bullshit and it became, it became what it needed to be. Now I know I got me a, I got me a gold mine now because I still seen the gold mine and I was willing to protect it at any means necessary. Okay. And if it was taking somebody's life and killing somebody because they wanted to come take what I was doing, then so be it. Okay. And one day, you know, within six months, nigga, this blew up. I know Alpo blew off the jukebox. That really put Alpo in the game. 2.30 this morning when police in the Bronx were called to the Sagamore Apartments at 167th Street and the Grand Concourse. I fell back after I got shot in 87. The caller said a man was shot on the third floor. When the cops got there, the door to apartment 3B was open. I'm falling back because, you know, police is on me now. They fuck is this dude? Everybody talking about my name was low before when I got shot with so many motherfuckers at the hospital. It brought forth, yo, know, who the fuck is this? We do believe that uh, it had something to do with the narcotics. The game is so deep that it goes into people's families, that people's families are hurting one another just to get what they can get. It's, it's that ugly. The person that set that situation up was A's girl's, or A's sister's boyfriend. The victims told police about Kevin Clark of the Bronx. Well, the cops tracked him down in Pennsylvania. He surrendered on Monday, and they brought him back to our town today. I remember when this kid first came home. You know, I remember A buying him a car, you know, giving him some money, putting some money in his pocket. For what? For money? For money that you could have got from him? But you, you jeopardize somebody else's life for this? And you a family member? You got to understand that, you know, getting shot, you know, five, six, seven times, you know, seeing your life flash in front of your face, amount of money don't mean shit. You know, money don't mean nothing no more. You just want to live. I felt like if I didn't stay away from it all, man. And it got to the point, you know, where A was just falling back. Cash wasn't trying to hear me, man. Like, when I told him, like, them niggas know everything, man. Who's who, what's what. Niggas like, yeah, whatever, man. We gonna still keep getting this money. Rich ain't shot. Poe ain't shot. You know, these niggas are still wanting to go hard. You understand what I'm saying? So I, I, I figured at that point on, when A kind of stepped back, you know, Poe and Rich stepped up. Me and Rich's relationship became real strong, man. We became we became like the best of buddies. Rich and, and Al were the, the two of the flyest niggas in Harlem. I mean, they were the, the originators of that, that, you know, you buy a car, I gotta buy the gear, I gotta buy the jewelry to match the car. See, these niggas had matching jewelry that matched their cars. Niggas was up on that. Niggas was like Batman and Robin. When you seen one, you seen the other. You know, these niggas started copying cars together. You know, we was the first, we was like some of the first young dudes to bust out with the convertible BM. Niggas had the American dream. Whatever you thought you saw in a magazine, that shit went down South Avenue. That's why everybody used to come out on the streets and just watch. And everybody drove sitting up straight. He bought the leaning way back in the seat all crazy. He had the B-50Z when he came to the avenue and that shit, young boy. With the T-top, with the beams on it, he had a bucket hat on, he had his son with him. Now you still see them, you still see niggas, man, when they drive their cars, the seat is all the way back. Rich and Poe started that shit. And they was young boys coming out, getting, getting paid. I mean, getting paid. I'm riding a van with him and Rich. You know, I get in the back seat. I tell these niggas, drop me off on 125th, I think. We was on 31st. I just jumped in the van with them. Yo, drop me off on 25th. Nigga, Rich was driving. No, Rich was in the passenger seat. Poe was driving. And nigga, you know, Poe drive all crazy. So when Poe made the turn, it was two big plastic bags like this high in the van, in the, in the floor way of the van. When Poe made the turn, the bags, like, leaned over and stacks fell out. I said, yo, 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 stop the car, stop the car. We was only, like, on 127th Street. I said, yo, what's up, Lou? I said, now let me out. I said, yo, we thought you said you were on 25th. I said, I am, but I'm cool right here. Let me out. Because it was too much money in that van. A lot of people were making money, but Alpo really stuck out. He had the best of both worlds. Negro stuck out from anybody. He had the looks, he had the charm, he had the money. I was so scared because it was so much money. There was one time we were there watching a movie and he came in with like bags, like 
like black bags and money. And this shit was filled, filled, filled to the top with money, 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 money. Dumped it on the floor and asked me and his sister to separate all the fives, the tens, and the twenties. And I'm like, I'm not sitting here separating all that money. My cousin got into the drugs and and they couldn't keep up with Alpo. And getting keys? Oh my God. We were delivering them like the mailman delivered mail. He would come on a motorcycle and he would and he would like, you know, what's up? You got that, you got that for me? And my cousin's like, Shh, yeah, I got it. And he's like, man, here, man. And he give him 15,000. Here you go, here's 15,000. Where's the where is it? And he looks at it. It's a Kia Coke. Okay, a Kia Coke. And he puts it in a, stuffs it down his pants. Big fucking key, stuffs it down his pants. He gets on the bike and he's like, all right. And he's like, I'll see you later. And all of a sudden I look, he comes back around the block. Woo, 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 woo. And I said, oh my God. And he's doing a fucking wheelie. And all of a sudden, the fucking key falls and breaks down First Avenue. A fucking key that I hear. And he spins around, he gets off the bike, puts the bike on a kickstand, and starts picking as much of he, I, what he can salvage. When he got that money, he let niggas knew he had money because the, the nigga was wearing shit that nobody else wasn't wearing. He took a style like Dapper Dan and made it a mainstream. Every hustler that was getting money was going to Dapper Dan and getting their own stuff custom made. You know what I'm saying? They blew Dapper Dan up so big. Boxes like Mike Tyson was coming up town buying Gucci outfits. The first time I seen him with a with a Louis Vuitton trench coat with the fur on it on in the rink. The nigga had the rust colored Tims on. Pay attention to the year that was that the pictures were took it. Just his rust on his feet. You know what I'm saying? Matching that jacket. He was just setting trends all over Harlem, all over New York City. He brought the adrenaline to the street. When we come down 8th Avenue up by 55th and all that, we bring the whole hood out. We would have our games up at the Rock, you know what I'm saying? It'd be Jam Pack, Pookie Wilson be playing, uh, 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 Rambo be playing, a lot of dunks, a lot of action, and all of a sudden you hear this boom, boom, boom. The street knew that it was coming. They all lined up. This nigga standing up doing 20 block wheelies. Looking at everybody, catching all the lights. With the shit hanging in the air like this. Evil Knievel had nothing on our pole. So all of a sudden, the crowd is looking, the crowd is looking. I mean, they're not even paying attention to the game. You see the whole crowd just in the middle of the street, looking down the street, just following them. This the nigga, only nigga I know, DJ Hollywood, used to make our pole special tapes only. Me and Boosie B would be rocking in the rooftop so hard. And that is the rooftop, man. You, you would think I was selling drugs in Detroit. When Alpo came in, everybody was like, oh, Alpo here, Alpo here. Him and Richard give us stacks of money to take pictures with, and I mean stacks like bricks. My man, my man, my man, Pooh, cool. he's in the building. Boosie B, you know how I used to do it. My man, 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 AZ in the house, along with Rich Porter, man. You know how we doing it. Yo, I need y'all to the DJ booth right away. All these cats would run up to Alpo and make sure they buy tickets. No, I'm just even buying a mixtape for back then. You get a knot like this, yo. Never got a knot for a cassette tape on your life. I'll give you $200 for a 60-minute tape. As long as you said his name. He even inspired niggas musically to do what they did. They would be the bad boys of the record business, the true bad boys of, of the record business, because with the financial backing, we didn't have to go to them crackers and all that. We had our own money. For all, that, for, the, for all that stuff. So we would have definitely been somewhat strong up in that industry, the Rockefellers and the, the bad boys and the, you know, loud records and all that. We would have, we would have had a hold on it because we would have brought the real gangster to the, to the, to the, to the, to the business. Alpo's name became probably more famous in the street than Alpo, the dog food, became for the fucking canines. He had so much fun, it, was, it wasn't even like a business thing. Niggas looked up to him like a superhero because he was a young cat doing it, getting a lot of money, man, and he made young cats want to get money. I wasn't the richest nigga in Harlem. He gave, I, yeah, I never knew who to be. Everybody, never. he gave everybody. But he was one of the most popular because of the shit that he was doing. Hustlers just put pranks all the way, uh, I mean, food, stuff to eat, all the way down the whole entire block. Niggas just stand online. Bus ride, they give it. Every year, every block had a bus ride. 
whoever wanna go can go. Money was nothing to him. Yeah, was- Everything motherfucking free, going down Virginia Beach. And when we went to Virginia Beach, when I met him, you see him walking through with his crew members, everybody, he having fun, snapping at everybody. It'd be a crowd of people, he might rush through the crowd, be like, watch out, she got a gun, and start trampling motherfuckers. He just had that about him, that charismatic shit, that everybody just wanted to be around him. You seen Apple, he got that Kool-Aid smile. Once he smiles, it's like his whole shit get Chinese on your ass. Well, I didn't know about guys in New York, but I knew I met the right group of guys. He was one of the first cats to come through, man, in a beach buggy. You know, sit with some big wheels and some systems and all that, and it really kind of like blew everybody's mind. Everybody stops and you can just hear whispers going, yo, that's ass, yo, that's ass. Money wasn't an issue with them. I told you, they were throwing this stuff around like it was toys and stuff, and you know, in the hotel room. Well, he would bring like at least six, six different girls that's coming to New York to meet people. When I went back to New York and I got with them, it really was like whatever K want. If you was a young girl that was dating one of those young guys, you was you was this shit. And he continuously would say that it's all right to be spoiled. It's all right to want your man to spoil you. So, you know, I'm loving this. If you had a girl and you liked her, she was getting a new BMW. I want a new car. Got it. I want to move. Where? You know what I'm saying? I need some money. Here. Take what you want. If it wasn't the jewelry, it was the trips they were taking, it was the girls driving around in the cars, the mink coats, the diamonds, and all that. We went up New York on the 4th of July. The motherfucker did some real John Gotti shit. He say, I want to get some fireworks for the kids for 105th, and he would go to the Italians on Pleasant Avenue, and the Italians were really shady about him, like, you know, who is this guy? So, so they were like, what do you need? We'll bring it out to you. And he's like, really, I want to see what you got. And he's like, well, how much money do you want to spend? Actually, I want to see what you got. And the Italians come fuck with him. How the Italians be doing all that fireworks and shit, they come fuck with him. We spent about 20000 a van full of fireworks. He said, just, I want it all. I'm taking the whole room. How much? And they added it all up, and I think it came to maybe fifteen, twenty thousand. 20000 He's like, OK, here, and give him the 20000 And they would just look, because they, they were like trying to be mafioso, and, they, and fucking this black John Gotti just came in and just bought the whole fucking place from him. They outlined the whole basketball court. It was about 25 of us. It took that many people to light every fireworks. Fourth of July, he blew up the whole party. did the Michael Jackson. Man. It used to be pitch, it used to be dark outside. He'll light this whole shit up like it was daytime. You know, everybody waiting on our pool to ask our pool for some money. Like, yo, yo, wait till he stop doing this fire, we gonna ask the nigga for money. Then he blew up a whole bag of shit where it was a cloud of smoke. Fucking basketball court corner fire, and that nigga disappeared like Michael Jackson. This shit just disappeared on it. Nobody knew where that, where that nigga disappeared. So much smoke. When the smoke cleared, Poe was gone. That shit was like amazing to everybody. That's when it was like, you know what I'm saying? Nigga was like on top of the world, son. The drug epidemic is as dangerous as any terrorist that we face. It is serious. It is an epidemic, and it. New York's can kill. Washington Square Park. Police here are cracking down on crack dealers. <laughs> Searching for those selling the newest and most potent drug in town. When crack hit Harlem, man, it was crazy, man. I mean, everybody and their mother was smoking. It's a drug that started on 145th Street and went to 42nd Street in three months. And three months after that, it went from 42nd Street to the entire Northeast. The first Avenue was a fucking drug market. Every building in the project had a different color top. When the crack epidemic hit, you understand? The small fried motherfuckers that was running errands, man, for the niggas back in the 70s, was bosses, man. When you look to your left, there was another 18 year old doing something. You look to your right, there was somebody else doing it. You look behind you, it's like it was just the norm. So you didn't feel like you was doing anything wrong. Like, you know, nobody could have said to you, yo, man, young boy, slow down, so on and so forth, because he would have had to tell everybody that was, you know, in, in his eyesight to do the same thing. Heron didn't do nothing compared to what crack did. We're talking about the drug that is responsible for the largest single dollar value in the United States, cocaine in general, and crack in New York has become the preferred form of cocaine. You've seen some of the baddest bitches in the world becoming crackheads. I mean, chicks that you wanted to probably make your wife that was looking so fucking fine was looking like shit in a matter of months, just shriveled up, gone. It's an amazing phenomenon to see what's happened. Three months ago, you could only buy crack in two or three areas in the city. Today, 
In 90 days, you can buy it in almost any neighborhood in the city. When that crack shit hit back in the 80s, that shit was like murder. That took the whole projects by a storm, you know? The price of coke had dropped down drastically, so you got a different kind of element of individual in the game. Everything is shrinking. The fraction of how much money you're making, everything is going down, going down with each change of the drug. Well, we all understand what that means. That means that the supply is going up, up, and up. And so the price per kilo is going down, down, and down. Heron took people a fraction down. Cocaine took fractions uh, uh, a little further down. Crack took fractions of people and made them absolutely nothing. I mean, guys that was really on and popping became nothing behind crack. I used to be on the avenue late night, so I remember Al, it was a BM, it was a Jeep, they pulled up on the avenue. And then I'm standing out there, you know, I'm all fucked up on that shit. And, you know, back in the days, you know, people just hit me. And I was younger, I was like five years younger than me. So I'm gonna say Alpo, so I'm saying that day, Alpo came out there one day with all, all those rich niggas, you know, I don't know, I don't know where them niggas was from. But they all got out the car and said, Alpo came to me and said, yo, do you believe I lose to work, we should be hustling out here for this nigga? Now look at this nigga. They would sell or give or do whatever to obtain it. I was always, when I see Poe car parked outside, I run to Poe window, yo, Poe, what's up? Throw niggas some change. So just for a joke, I, th I think Poe took it as a joke. He shot at me and shit, you know, and it hit the tree. Then I left, you know, I left. When I came back, I seen Poe getting into his car. I said, Poe, what's up? And he left. He said, you a stupid nigga, but I shoot at you, you still come to me. Then he hit me up with like a couple hundred, said, yo, go ahead, cut away. You know, dope wasn't really violent. You know what I'm saying? Dope niggas was getting high, you know. You catch a nigga leaning for about 30 minutes before he this close to the floor, before he about to bump his head, but he's still standing up. You know what I'm saying? The crack era just changed everything around, man. Everybody on the corner had a crack package then. Everybody in Harlem was selling crack then. So it wasn't like back in the 80s or 81, 82, when, when Al, Rich, and, and, and A were in pocket, and, and that's all you heard was those three names. It ain't like that no more. Now every little small fry got a, got a block, and got a spot, and now things are changing. Down the block, like on First Avenue was like the coke and the dope. Every 10, 20 steps, it was like, when the cops blitzed, they didn't know who to go after. Especially in the 80s and the 70s, for us to pack up and go down to DC. And if anybody knows about DC in the 80s, it was like the murder capital. This town used to be the town to be in. Everybody was getting money. DC took them to a whole nother level. We flooded DC so much, there were times I would go down to DC and I would see more New York dudes on the block than I would see DC dudes on the block. You know, he kept coming back, man, like larger than life, larger than life. He came from the jump for me because I asked him. I didn't want to go back up there, so I told him to come down here. So now, that's what 45th, so 45th Street is starting to just really just become a headache to me now. Okay. So I'm starting to say to myself, you know what? I'm about to leave this thing alone. So in the process of doing that, I go down to D.C. The girl Karen invites me down to D.C. And I go on down there. I put my jewelry together, and I go on down there by myself. And I'm getting familiar with everybody. All the niggas from out of town was feeling them also. He was a happy-go-lucky person, you know, just smiling. Hug me, talk to me like he'd been knowing me for years, you know. And right off the bat, he called me mom. I would go to work. He would wait at my house all day. He was tired of sitting around in here, you know, waiting for Karen to come from work. Then he started going out on his own. And he learned D.C. better than I knew D.C. He would like to go out with my sister and her friends. He would hang with me and Wendy in the clubs. We would take him to the go-go's. The nigga's smile 
is what captured everybody. And he embracing all these DC niggas. You know, he hit these niggas off with a lot of cake, you know, buying niggas cars. They going out to Eddie Lennox, going shopping and all that. He came right, you know what I'm saying? He ain't come trying to take over nothing or move in on this or cut into that. I had good customers. I had anywhere from 10 to 15 good customers because I was giving it to him at a good price because if DC was letting him go, if someone had him in DC for 21, 22, I was letting him go for 18. So whenever a nigga was giving you like 50 keys on consignment, man, how could you go wrong? Poe wasn't making three, four hundred thousand dollars in Harlem. You know what I'm saying? He was making that in D.C. That nigga had a connect. You can't do nothing but blow up when you got a connect like that. You can't do nothing but, you can't do nothing but get money. And that's how he became really as large as he was because his competition at that time, if, you know, for those who know, was, was the kid Ray from Evans. And he was, you know, labeled as a $300 million nigga. He was like one of the biggest cats coming up out of D.C. Okay. He doing life now in prison, but I want to meet him and... You know, when he went to jail. He did get even more popular because he's from New York. He coming down here. He trying to beat everybody prices, you know. That's when I really, basically almost like, really took over the town. The post situation, when he went out of town to D.C., he started getting extremely a lot of money. When I saw Al Post's turning point is when Rich died. I was on my way to um, Otisville Penitentiary, upstate New York, to see someone. And Alberto had already told me prior to that, that, you know, you know somebody kidnapped Richard brother and they want money and they stuck his finger in the recording and left it, you know, all that. So, I'm, it's this, it's like a van to take you up to the prisons of New York. They got the little, the transportation service to take you. So I'm waiting with this girl from DC. I went with her. We waiting for the transportation van. I see the paper with Rich's brother on the front page. So I pick it up so I can buy it and read it. Cause you know, our brother already told me that the little boy was kidnapped. So I'm reading, reading, and it went to, they found Richard. So right then and there, you know, I just, that was my friend too. I got like emotional, you know, cause he told me Richard's brother, but he didn't, Richard wasn't dead at this point. So I'm reading the paper and that's a hell of a way to find out. And she called me and told me that she had saw it in the paper about Richard and his brother that got killed. And I was like, well, you know, and I was, it, I was scared and I was shocked. And I, you know, scared cause she was up there in New York where all this, these things was happening, you know, and so, you know, I, I, just, I think I told her to come on home or something, so Alberta happened to call me right after I talked to Karen, and I told him that I had just talked to her and what she had saw in the paper about Richard, you know. And he was like, whoa, when? And I said, she, you know, I just talked to her. And she was saying that she had the paper. He said, oh, my God. He said, tell, uh, call Karen and tell her to come home. Get from up there down. She don't need to be up this too much crazy stuff going on. So I was like, okay, he said, damn, he said, you sure? And I was like, sure, I'm sure. She just called me and told me. He said, oh my God. He said, well, tell her, call her back and tell her, I said, to come on home, get from up there now. And she said, I told Alberto what you told me. So she was like, and he left this number. He said, call soon as you get, you know, back to this lady's house, call. So I called and he was like, bring the paper that you saw that in. It was like, he didn't know, you know, so I'm like, hold up. And he was like, you don't need to be up there. Stay right there, I'm gonna call number 10. I'm like, who the hell is number 10? I'm gonna call number 10 or something to come and get you to bring y'all home. You don't need to be up there right now. So I get to my mother's and he meet me there. He read the paper. He had me fooled, he reading it and dropped his head like he upset, you know? And I'm like, just watching like, I'm getting all teary eyed and stuff like, damn, they killed Richard, I can't believe this. He went through the whole nine yards, you know, like he ain't know nothing about it and all. He was like, he lost his best friend. Al Poe walk in the restaurant with this girl. I'm like, wow, I ain't seen this dude in a minute. He sits down. We acknowledge each other. We go outside like men, like yo. First thing he said, yo, yo, hey man, why everybody think I did that to Rich? 
it was times where I saw him after that happened to my brother and he couldn't even look at me. Why Pat and her mom going around saying I did this to Rich? I'm like, yo, fam, man, they not the only one saying that shit. It's a lot of people feeling that way. He said, yo, if you think if I was to give them 50000 a piece, man, they, uh, I let it go. I, I said, yo, fam, look, man, you shook hands? I said, do what you think is best. Man. When he said that to me, he told me, he confirmed me and my thoughts that he did that. Now I know it probably was just his, like, his guilt, but at that time, my mother said from day one through the door, Alpo killed my son. But I know the thing is, did I, did I kill, did I kill Rich? And uh, yes, yes I killed Rich. Why did I kill him? It wasn't personal, it was business. How could you kill something you love, man? That's real confusing to me, man. How could you kill something that love you? I'm, I'm gonna tell you this, cause Rich, Rich, like I told you, like the story I do with the with the connect and all that. Rich, he was lying to me about something that there was no reason to lie to me about, and in my mind, it just told me that if 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 this if this little bit of money can come between what I thought was a was a was a wonderful relationship and a friendship, then no telling what you might sell me down the line for. But on some real shit, man, you shouldn't have did that to Rich, man. Shouldn't have did it, man. I don't give a fuck, man. And I gave him the opportunity to tell me the truth, not once, but twice. So when I already made the, when I already made the, the, uh, when I already came with the prayer on my little man and, like, yo, if he lied to me, we just gonna do what we need to do. Then that's what happened. You could have did anything, man. It could have been forgotten, man. Forgiven, man. Damn, man. Not that, though. Shit, man. I don't want to keep repeating myself, but I will say that, uh... Richard died, he was here to stay for sure. So I wind up staying with the girl Karen and her family. You hearing about Alpo this, Alpo that, and you know dudes ask me, you know that dude? He was well known because he went everywhere. He was in every little crack in every little corner. He wanted to be popular, he wanted to know everybody. Things were changing also down here, see? The game was changing, the streets was changing. He knew he came into some hungry dudes trying to get on their feet. He helped a lot of niggas out, niggas was in jail. You know, he bailing motherfuckers out, you know what I'm saying? He hit niggas off with money, giving motherfuckers opportunity to get money, man. You go out, he with anybody. He hang with anybody. He was around a whole bunch of grimy niggas. You can't trust everybody. They don't know you, you ain't from here, you get money, be careful. There's another element to this game, and it's called the wolf. It's called the stick-up kid. It's called the Snatch Kid. But things started getting a little, things started getting kind of crazy for me. And you have to be aware that these niggas exist, man. <laughs> this is a reality. This is a reality. You can't deny it, and you can't get away from it. And it's all a part of the game. This is a package deal. I was at home watching television, and a nurse called me, and she was like, do you know an Albert Hill? No, why? She was like, because he was just shot. The helicopters is taking him to such and such hospital, and he gave you a name. I got shot because they was trying to kidnap me in D.C. So I'm thinking, where he get shot? She was like, he got shot in his body. He's in surgery. They didn't even know if he was going to make it. They couldn't tell us that. One thing that saved me that day was that as I'm talking to this dude, he looks over my shoulder. And when he looked over my shoulder, I followed his eyes. And when I followed his eyes, seen about four dudes coming to try to grab me. Okay. And I start running. Next thing I know, I feel bullets and all that coming past my head and hitting off the wall and all that. And one caught me in the rib. He made it out of surgery and they had him recovery. Looking in his eyes, like he was, like he hoped he don't die. They had all this stuff hooked up to him and the machine was breathing for him. Seeing him like that, I just 
try to keep talking to hold back tears because I just wanted to cry, you know. I felt like, damn, he met her. He down here on the strength for her. Now he done got out here. We didn't introduce him to all these people. I hope he don't die, but he pulled through. But I was nervous for him. I could see it changed him. He had no choice but to change. It won't, I mean, you down here, niggas shooting you, trying to rob you now. It's like, to me, he knew I got to step my game up, you know, because they like, if they can do it and get away with it, his attitude was like, everybody going to start trying to come at him then. <laughs> Al say, man, you know, killers respect killers, man. Nobody ain't taking shit from Al. I, I definitely had to, I definitely had to, to understand that, yo, what I'm doing ain't right, but that's what I needed to do for me. Everybody murderers, man. The thing, you know, just under the right circumstances, whether they're going to withdraw it or not. If he wouldn't have had that killer instance when he went to D.C., he wouldn't have never made it out of D.C. Murderers and everybody, man. You know what I'm saying? To body a nigga is self-preservation. Like, when you would see him... It was a whole nother picture when you saw him now because it was serious. It was something serious. It was on a whole different level. You see what I'm saying? Law enforcement authorities have been able to make more than 350 arrests prior to today and to seize more than 19,000 pounds of cocaine which have a wholesale value of $270 million. When I first got the information from the prosecutor, and I'm listening to what the prosecutors and the FBI agents are telling me, and they're telling me about all these murders, they're talking to me about all the money he's been making, they're talking to me about all of the uh, weight that's been um, brought from New York and from other places down to the District of Columbia and they're showing me the proof that they have and the surveillance and the witnesses statements and I'm sitting there and trying to take it all in. They was trying to look to give me the death penalty or if they couldn't succeed with the death penalty they was going to try to give me the rest of my natural life in jail. We had murders two blocks away from the White House. And when I got the information I remember I went back to to see him at the jail and we sat down and I stared at him for about two or three minutes, I was just shaking my head and I said to him, you know, I can't believe all what I'm seeing and hearing here. My lawyer was like, look, your ace in the hole is, uh, if they ever ask you to uh, tell, you really need to think about that. I think what was so surprising to them was the um, ability of uh, Mr. Martinez to recall details and information about transactions. We believe that as many as 2,000 pounds of cocaine entered this country in a single shipment. I got this deal coming up with this, this connect. I say anywhere from like six million dollars worth of coke. And it was common for traffickers to hand our ever undercover agents as much as 1.5 million dollars at a time. I had like 1.5. I put up like 1.5 and I was just telling my little man for him to just put up a half a mil. He tells somebody down in Lawton prison about this deal. Only thing he didn't know that my man Wayne heard him say this. He's like, yo, we was down here talking trash. This is how much anger he built up for me. I said, oh yeah. I said, no, we got to do this right now. Can't just be running up on in broad daylight. That's gonna come back to us. So we gotta do this right and we gotta get him where nobody know. I go meet him on Florida Avenue. We get a little revolver out of the out the stash and I give it to the dudes that's sitting in back of my man. So my man, he's in the middle. But he don't know that we don't slip the revolver to the back to the kid who's going to hit him in the head. Mm -hmm. We ran for about five, ten minutes after we get the gas. Bang, my man hit him. I give the signal through the rear view mirror. My man hit him with the revolver, two in the head. All you hear is, ugh. He, he winds up shitting on himself okay. from his muscles relaxing. Okay. So, you know, he's stinking up the car and all that. So that's how the thing came about that his, his dick was chopped off. So we had to find some woods. So we, I had to find somewhere to dump him at, so we wind, up, we wind up taking him in this park over on 16th Street in Northwest. The agents were just uh, amazed at how uh, he could recall every bit of information about everything they were, they were uh, talking about. So my lawyer came back at me and was like, look, they're trying to make a deal, man. They really want Wayne Perry. They want you, but they also want Wayne Perry. 
And if you got anything good on Wayne Perry, they're willing to make a deal with you. So I was like the less of two evils. Me and Wayne, we were both evil to them, but I was the less evil one. Like, we can sleep with him, but right. we can't do nothing with Wayne Perry. I'm quite sure Wayne knew not to trust Alberto that much, and I'm quite sure in the back of his mind, he knew this nigga not from here. He's from New York. So if it all go down, you know what I'm saying? He going to turn against us. You have to think that way, especially if you're dealing with a person that he can go back home. Poe let the system rape him and turn him into something that he wasn't. He was a hell of a good dude, you know what I'm saying? But he let the federal government rape him. He made the decision to become a government witness and to uh, testify against his friends and people that he had done business with and people who had committed murders on his own behalf. He, he ran through a whole wide range of emotions. Once you, once you take the position that I've taken, you have to tell it all. Once the decision to cooperate was made, there was no turning back. Because if he turned back, he would be spending the, less, the rest of his life in jail. It came out the 14 that I, that I copped out to. Copped and when I say copped out to win, in my position as far as doing what I had to do for me, as far as t testifying and all that, and I had to confess to those murders. I had to tell those murders. He wasn't born a killer. But when you run in with killers, you begin to be a killer. In life, in life you make choices. And sometimes those choices are good and they're bad. When I asked Al about a particular person that he may have killed, um, I was hurt when I heard it. And um, he explained to me that, you know, sometimes in the game, it's either you or the person. And he said at that time, it had to be the person or it would have been him.
from the producers of Beef, Rock the Bells, the true story of an impossible mission. Well, we got the big Wu-Tang reunion coming out here, man. Yeah. You gonna be out here for that? Everybody on the same stage in one night. People want to see Wu-Tang Clan together. There are people that were too young or weren't able to ever see them as a group. You know, the best you could hope for is to get three or four cats at a time in any one place. Tell me if all of them gonna show up? No way. One man puts it all on the line. Basically just had to refinance my house to get some of the money. For his once-in-a-lifetime dream. Had to get the okay from the wife. I don't I really think he even asked my permission. He just said, babe, this is what we're doing. And I'm like, OK. <laughs> you know, I had to borrow a couple extra dollars from my mother. Critics call Rock the Bells riveting mesmerizing. Chain went and booked everybody individually. You got Doty? Yeah. I said, you got everybody? Yeah. Yeah, I said, you know what? Is that the line? You got 15,000 people coming to the show. It tear your place up if the act don't show up. Outright exhilarating. Oh. 200 people rush the front door right now. We worked 10 years to get this show together, guys. Hey, I want to see a show. Do you guys not want to see a show? Wu Tang is in the building. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, ODB is on his way in right now from the hotel. Guys, guys, chill out. We got a crowd in there that's explosive. Literally like a nuclear bomb ready to go off. And ODB is not coming. What did you say, Mike? We're working on that right now. An electrifying, nerve-wracking knockout of a film. You want to go without him? No. Uh -huh. It ain't the same thing. It is a big deal. It's, that's right. It's a super big deal. I'm not coming. I'm not coming. I'm not coming. ODB was not coming. Period. <laughs> Best hip hop documentary to date, featuring performances by Idea and Abilities, Charlie Tuna and DJ Newmark, Supernatural, and his son Hodge Sage Francis, Dilated Peoples, and Red Man, with three hours of special features, including extended interviews and featurettes. Rock the Bells, own it on DVD. Troy Reed Street Stars come into DVD. Four new DVDs, four real life stories featuring the street's most notorious hustlers. No matter where you go, there's a street star, there's a story. Game over, a hard look at life on the street. Rich Porter. The star buying me coats, jewelry, and they wasn't none but 16 years old. AZ. I can make at least 50 thou now a week. And Alpo. I used to come in here and buy cars for cash. They built an empire from the streets up. And now hear Alpo's side of the story in Game Over Part 2. Yes, I killed Rich. It was business. How loyalty to the life made a man kill his best friend in cold blood. You run in with killers, you begin to be a killer. But the life wasn't for everyone. The Larry Davis story. The city's most wanted fugitive is still Larry Davis. He wanted out of the game. Larry had too much on the cops. But the cops wanted him dead. Larry hadn't fired a shot when that slug creased his head. And see how a rising sports star looked for his ticket out. The Carlton Hines story. People were actually intimidated by Carlton on the court. When this baller took his hustle to the streets. Friends say that he knew too much about the inner workings of drug dealing. Carlton was getting so much money that he had to put basketball on the back burner. It was the beginning of his end. This is the uncensored, unmerciful look at the street game and the men that became street stars. Coming soon on four separate DVDs. My mother, she says Italians are like diamonds. <laughs> we come in all different shades. How you doing? Life is filled with twists and turns. But Renato's life. When you're feeling so fine and your thoughts smell like wine, that's amour. Is about to take him Ooh. for one huge loop. We are your real parents. My parents? Ha! It's the truth. Lyra! Oh, God! Oh, God! Oh, God! Born black. After 22 years, here's your brother. What's up? How you doing? Raised Italian. You pull off that whole Sinatra singing, dancing thing really well. Oh, that's because I'm Italian. Prove it. Lestane Lorina. Dare I ask what that means? You're standing in dog piss. Oh. All mixed up. Let's play ball. 
These guys look really good. See, we didn't play basketball in my neighborhood. From the creators of Me, Myself, and Irene, Stuck on You, and The Ringer. Hey, Roy! Uh, it's like you're not even trying. You see this over here? I was raised Italian. Comes a comedy about changing your life. <laughs> this is who I am. Hold this one second. Without changing who you are. All right, I can see how someone might mistake me for a black. That's my car! Give it here! Donald Faison. Hey, hey, that's ketchup. Put that down. That's for white folks. You want this. Mama's hot sauce. Mm. Be careful with that stuff, Pops. That'll have you crapping fireballs. Jamie Lynn Sigler. Here I come, baby! Oh. Joey Fatone. Look what my grandmother got. It's an air freshener. You can get that anywhere. Uh, it's a scratch and sniff air freshener. And Whoopi Goldberg. He's partying now. He's having a good old time. <laughs> Omi Spumoni. Own the unrated DVD Tuesday. I know I'm black, but I'm just not good at it yet. Takes practice.